In this episode of Mind Pump, so this is our Qua episode, Q&A episode. Yeah. This is where we answer questions from listeners like you. They post them on our Instagram page, Mind Pump Media. We pick the best ones and then we answer them. But we also talk about current events, our lives, and just have a lot of fun. That's in the introductory portion of this episode. So here's what we did in this awesome episode. We started out by talking about the movie Good Boys. It's now out for rental on Amazon. Absolutely hilarious. Adam gave us an update on his powerlifting routine. He is currently following MAPS Powerlift on his goal to becoming extremely average at the squat, deadlift, and bench press. <laughs> <laughs> Justin had to buy more weight plates because he's a hoss. Yeah. That's right. He's a hoss. Watch out, everybody. Now, he did buy his plates and his home equipment from PRX. PRX makes home equipment with very low profiles, but it's very sturdy equipment. In other words, you can have a squat rack that literally folds into your wall. So if you want to park your car in the garage, use your room for something else, you can, but then it easily folds out. Super inconspicuous. Boom, you have a uh, very functional, sturdy piece of home equipment that rivals the best commercial workout equipment. And we have a hookup for you because they are one of our sponsors. So if you go to prxperformance.com forward slash mind pump and use the promo code mind pump, you'll get 5% off your purchase, and we'll send you a free MAPS Prime program. Oh, this is get for, hooked up. This is for purchases over $500. Then I talked about hitting the rails before finding the middle. We were mentioning how one social media influencer has decided to go celibate yeah. for six months, so that's uh, good luck to Stop him. Stop nutting. Uh, we talked about uh, NBC and how they're launching a new e-commerce site. That's kind of interesting. I talked about studies on sauna use, uh, which is kind of fascinating. Boosts endurance in one study up to 32%. By the way, regular sauna use, growth hormone levels explode, has a beneficial effect on your hormones, and may actually speed up the muscle building process. Now, one of our favorite sauna producers is Clearlight. They make Clearlight infrared saunas. These are made by, excuse me, these are jacuzzi infrared saunas made by Clearlight. Uh, and we have a promotion for you. If you go to infrared sauna, dot com forward slash mind pump you'll get up to six hundred dollars off if you mention mind pump make sure you tell them you heard about them through mind pump for that discount then we talked about the haunted house that gives people twenty thousand dollars we talked about this on a previous episode well we have more details for you apparently it's a torture chamber yeah it's like eight hours of torture it's called Mc, uh McCarmy, McCamey manor i think then we talked about how airbnb is tightening up the reins apparently there's um, some crazy stuff that happened over the holiday season with uh, Halloween. Oh, people. Then I talked about a cancer study that tells us, it reminds us actually why cancer sucks ass so much. Then we got to the, the question portion of this episode. This is where we answer questions. First question, is there a difference between training with bands or cables? Like what are the benefits between each of them and how different are they? Next question, what are the best weighted exercise for building abs? You may be wondering why you would want to add weight to exercise for abs. That way they, they show more. You build them like any other muscle. By the way, we have a guide on training your abs. Uh, go to mindpumpfree.com and check that out. Next question. This person wants to know why bodybuilders seem to have a worse relationship to food than other athletes. We had a great discussion there. Mm. And the final question. Uh, have we ever dealt with being super disciplined but also maintaining a healthy social life and personal relationships. Like, what's the balance there? Also, this month, brand new promotion, MAPS Performance 50% off. Now, MAPS Performance is our yes. workout program based entirely around physical, functional, athletic performance. So in this workout, you're going to train different ranges of motion and different planes of motion, meaning you can go side to side, front to back, twisting, You'll get more explosive, faster, stronger. This is a huge calorie-burning workout because there's a an athletic component, so great for fat loss. And it's excellent for mobility. This is the only program we have with structured mobility sessions. These are sessions to improve your ability to move, improve your ranges of motion, all of which contribute to better muscle gain and more fat loss. And of course, better movement patterns. Again, it's 50% off. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapsgreen.com and use the code GREEN50, G-R-E-E-N-5-0, no space, 
for the discount. So <laughs> last night, uh, Katrina and I sat down. We actually had a little, uh, you know, so it's so funny how excited we get when we get like, we had to get to sit by the fire for like an hour and a half. And then we actually watched a full movie. Like, I can't remember the last time that we, <laughs> we strung, yeah, you know, right. three hours. Uninterrupted? Yeah, uninterrupted. Wow. Like, he's, he's, we've got him now going down to bed, like, with the, the, the time change, right? So we pushed the clock back. Well, we didn't, you know, change his time. We just said, okay. Take advantage. Yeah, take advantage of the setting back. Like, he's going now. Now we're getting him ready at uh, 6 o'clock for bed, and he's in bed by, like, 6.30. Uh, so, and, you know, he, he tossed a little bit, did his thing, but by about 7.30, Dude, he this was is, out. This is why I've gone on trips with um, friends of mine who have little kids, and we'll go to, like, Cabo or whatever, and I'm like – you know, I'm there to relax. Man, they go wild. Yeah. <laughs> they go nuts. Yeah, yeah. Because they're like, no yeah, kids, yeah. you know? They're just Uninhibited. Like, they have the energy of like 21-year-olds, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, man, you guys are, you're not going to bed. You guys are going crazy. You're partying so hard. Like, we don't have the kids. It's yeah. first time in it's a year. It's kind of neat because it, and it, it, going back to all, all the things that I think why people say having uh, kids is so amazing is I also see how it makes us uh, grateful for things that we probably would just yeah. take for granted, right? Like, like time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I can think right now. Yeah. Sitting, yeah. sitting by a fire for two hours, then transitioning to watch a movie, just her and I, uh, becomes like, wow, that was such an amazing night. We had. <laughs> yeah, totally. So, what you guys watch? So amazing. Good Boys. Oh. We finally watched. I was so pumped. I, I, I clicked on my Apple and uh, it popped up and I told her, I was like, oh shit, this is the movie that... Sal was talking about in the theater that was just so hilarious. Tell me it wasn't hilarious. It was great. Dude, it was really funny. It was so I well made. FOMO. Oh man, it depicts what being a twelve-year-old boy. I mean, it really is like where you you're not yet cool. Like you don't know shit yet, but you think you do. You're putting up a front that you do. Yeah, yeah. like you'll you'll say things to your buddies, and you know. So th there's a couple scenes in the in the movie where they'll say something like. Uh, yeah, I don't remember what they were talking about, but they're talking about sex. You know, they don't know. What oh, the hell yeah, obviously, yeah. don't know what they're talking about, but they think they do. Yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah, you know, and you, you make, you know, and then, and then, you know, when you make her coom, and the guy's like, oh, yeah, yeah. He's like, don't you think yeah. it, isn't it cum? And he goes, no, I'm pretty sure it's coom. Yeah, you yeah. know, because <laughs> they, totally no, they have no, they have no idea. What no, they did about. a really good. In fact, they did such a good job that you, as you're watching that, you probably can't help but take a, a trip down memory lane. Exactly and, what uh, happened. Right, and remember like being a kid with your buddies and acting cool and acting like you know everything. Oh, <laughs> I can't wait to see because that actually, I mean, it's really like relevant right now. Like my oldest, he's, you know, he's uh, he's just old enough to where like he'll hear, hear terms. And so he actually brought that up. Like he brought sex up and we, like in the middle of like a, a movie, he's like, what, are they going to have sex? You know? No, he didn't. <laughs> and I was like, and Courtney and I were kind of laughing it off, and we're like, "What? Like, what do you know about that? You know?" And he's like, "I don't know. That's something to do with love." <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, okay, that's all right, right. <laughs> all right, yeah. Let's let's keep that. Yeah, that, that's all you need to know." I remember that man. Twelve, thir you know, right around twelve, thirteen. You're just cussing way more than you normally would, just because yeah. you're just like, "I can now." Yeah, you know, I think I'm tough. Talking about crazy shit, and you don't know what the hell you're talking about. You're still a little kid. <laughs> just throwing it out there, you know? Yeah, it's the yeah, funniest thing, yeah, I heard that. Adam, I was asking you, I, you're, you posted on your story um, some of your workout again, and uh, update update on your, because you're, what, week two now in the Mavs Powerlift? Yeah, no, I'm uh, I'm on week two right now, and actually, uh, and this is a good, it's great you're bringing this up, because um, I've been asked, a bunch of people are like, oh, you know, how where are your calories, and how are you eating, and- uh, I'm not tracking right now. I'm not tracking. I'm not really paying attention. I'm kind of intuitively eating. But here's an example, and, and I think I've talked about this on the show many times, on uh, why there's so much value in tracking and kind of figuring out where you're at. Uh, and, and what led me to this uh, conclusion is that I went to do bench again, and I definitely didn't progress. In fact, I struggled to get the same reps out that I got the previous week. And I program falling to a T sleep is is pretty damn good right now uh gave myself adequate recovery but if I if I'm probably short on anything I'm probably like I usually am when I'm not tracking I'm probably short on my protein intake and I'm not eating really high calorie right now especially considering that I'm training like this now and so that's just a, an indicator for me that I need to dive into my nutrition a little bit and address that and so this week uh, you know, setting a goal for myself to get my calories up, make sure I hit my protein intake. So 
I can see where I'm at. I didn't regress like so because it, uh, the the way the program's written, it's scaling up every week. So you know, I had an additional set, but you know, I was looking forward to to benching yesterday, hoping that I would feel like strength gains, and I didn't feel that. I felt like that I, I you know struggled. In fact, one of the sets I I came a, a rep short of what the previous week. And uh, I'm sure this happens to a lot of people in their program. And normally I look to things like, you know, what was my sleep like the day before? What has my stress levels been? Um, and then also nutritionally, what's been going on? Play, calories play a huge role in strength gains. Yeah. A huge role. And now you can go on a cut and train for strength, but here's what will happen. You'll maybe not gain strength depending on where you're where you're at. If you're advanced, you're probably not going to gain strength. If you're a beginner, you might still gain some strength. But what it'll do is prevent the muscle loss or at least mitigate the metabolic slowdown that happens with a cut. So it's like I'm cutting. One of the drawbacks of cutting is my metabolism will slow down to try to adapt. And one of the ways your body your metabolism adapts is by paring muscle down. So it's this is not shocking. Most people have experienced this, but when you cut your calories, you tend to get weaker in your workouts. So training for strength tends to mitigate that. So if you're relatively advanced or intermediate and your strength, you're training for strength, but your calories aren't up to par, if you maintain your strength, you're doing a good job. But if you want to gain strength, you got to bump calories. Yeah. You absolutely have to. And this is where power lifters in the past have gotten a bad rap yeah. because – they just power They overdo on. it. Well, I mean, because they know this. They see the strength gains. I mean, even sometimes – you can even get stronger with crappy workout programming just by eating way more calories. I mean, yeah. you know, like you're gain some body fat too. Right. Uh, and so this is where the stereotype of the fat, you know, power lifter or whatever um, comes from. All mass is good mass. Yeah. So, yeah. But no, calories play a massive I – noticed, I noticed this for myself um, very clearly. And I, I, mean, I mean, I'm sure you did you too. I pieced this together a long time ago. Working out, it's like, oh, if I just eat more, I'll get stronger. Totally. And if I don't eat enough, I'm not going to get weaker. It's my you know, favorite I'm mentality, gonna... though. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> just eating more and then like lifting heavier. Oh, it just makes me happy inside. Yeah. Like later on, the reveal, not so great. You know, you got to kind of <laughs> figure that one out. But uh, yeah, I was going through, I just started myself. So I, I oh, went, did you start it? I just started and, and was going through, you know, bench days and, uh, and then just got into squatting again and, and trying to grease the groove. And, um, I was, I was stacking my plates in, uh, you know, downstairs in, in my, in my room. And, um, I got up, I have like 300 pounds. So I, I was like kind of trying to test myself again. I haven't really tried to test myself squat wise. And so it's like, it's there, it's, it's there. Like I had a good day. I felt like strong and I felt energetic. And, um, now I'm like, dude, I, I, I need some more weights, man. I need to get, I need to get more plates down there. I need to start Dang, loading that, it up again. You're getting that strong, huh? No, it's, it's, it's not that it's getting that strong. I, I didn't have that much. I was kind of coasting. You know what I mean? It <laughs> yeah. was that mentality of like, ah, let's manage it. Let's, let's keep the maintenance up. Let's keep what I got. But I really haven't pressed in a long time. And I know I'm capable of a lot more. It's just I haven't had the passion in that mm. direction. Now, yeah. when you originally uh, ordered your PRX, did you order a kit or did you build everything individually? Yeah, I, they, I know they have, they have, okay, they have kits. I ordered a kit and I actually did, uh, like I bought a couple like from like a, a local like play it against sports. I, I bought a few like weight plates uh, in, in addition to what they offered. But yeah, I just, I just went back on there and, and ordered more uh, of their specific uh, bumper plates that they offer for that. So I got like some more 45s and then uh, Courtney wanted, you know, more tens and, and 25s, actually a 35. So I did a whole host of, of new weights to kind of throw down. How, there. how many, how much could you max out your bar on with the plates that you have now? Not, not the ones you're ordering. Are you able to go up to 500 pounds? Um, I almost like, I, I think like I, I probably need to get a longer, bigger bar. I don't mm -hmm. know if that's like a Texas bar or like, that's all right. You can't deadlift that anyways. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see about that. You'll bench press. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Come yeah. On. yeah that's the thing. Crazy. Like I, we all have our lifts, right? Yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's what I need work, dude. I'm not going to, I got to talk shit cause I don't have a lift, bro. I'm just, uh, I'm just like average at all of them. What yeah. you talking about? So, I don't have a lift. <laughs> my, my, my bench is coming back, man. I'm excited about that. Though. And like even, even um, like that. Uh, uh, what's Mark Bell's uh, slingshot? Like I, th 
just in terms of like the days where my my joints are really speaking to me quite a bit and like uh, just having that is like getting <laughs> getting more reps in i'm like what, thanks man what are they saying to you hey i'm old like oh, ooh. <laughs> huh ah. yeah. stuff like that yeah. adam if you were a superhero would you be like hawkeye like you're just kind of good at a little bit good at everything <laughs> yes. you don't have anything cool <laughs> no, just like, that's kind of where i'm at man i'm yeah. like i am i'm pretty uh i'm decent at uh at everything i'm not great at anything. ideally that's where you want to be anyway yeah i guess you know i think that I think for me, um, I I never had a a body type that probably was great. Maybe deadlifting is probably my uh, my strength. Come on, dude! You 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 tried to get a high deadlift for a year of your whole life, yeah. yeah. And you got up to <laughs> so five fifty. Fairly new. Yeah, I think you're and you're you're lo- you're tall. You got long arms and you're built to deadlift. I can I can guarantee you this: if you focused on deadlift for a while you'd probably pull 600 pounds yeah we'll see i mean i'm excited uh i'm excited to get after this i did uh, on my instagram too i posted it which will be great because i can go back and kind of reference as t- towards the end of this program um I, I did a couple heavy single days right before i started the program to kind of see where i was mm-hmm. at before i went into uh went into this so it'll be interesting to see where i come up but for sure um i know i need to address uh nutrition which uh, of course right it's not like uh uh, I, I I thought maybe I could get into it without uh, dialing in my nutrition right away, and then I would uh, start to do that later on. But after the first week of, of feeling that way, I'm like, oh, okay, I just I got to put some more yeah, effort. It's into important. It. It's not as important as getting shredded. Like when, when you right, like right. nutrition for getting shredded is like you have to like every minor detail, mm-hmm. but it's still important to get stronger. Yeah, for me, it's uh, and what I'll do just do so the audience knows how I would do that because I I don't feel like I just don't feel like tracking like crazy, but I will I'll track my protein and pretty much calories. Like I'll make mm-hmm. sure. I'm getting adequate uh, protein and getting enough calories you for like 200 grams of protein or more. Yeah, right around 200. That's normally good for me. Even 180 is okay. I'm I'm just uh, I definitely can fall way less. Yeah. You know, it's really especially when we're like, you know, right now when I'm not again, I'm not trying to track or focus. I'm intuitively eating. A lot of times I won't eat breakfast. I won't eat till noon or one. Noon or one, I get a, a good meal, maybe at Luna or something. Which what, what's that got? 40 grams, maybe mm-hmm. 50 grams of protein in it. And then I train, and then I come home later in the evening, and I eat one or two more times. And imagine even if so, each- like a hundred to one hundred thirty grams of protein. Yeah, so I can easily fall, uh, on which the- is adequate to keep you where you're at. Yeah, healthy, but not to push you. Past. Yeah, not if I'm trying to gain. Yeah, not, yeah. especially yeah. this program too. I mean, it's yeah. definitely a, a good amount of volume per muscle group. Yeah, uh, I've been sore. You know, way sore on uh, after all my workouts. So I definitely need- now. Are you going to add like the fractionals, like the little two and a halfs too, and like really get like to the little detail of it? Well, when he gets because at this this far into the program, there's no percentages, right? Right yeah. now, you're just lifting. Not yet. Yeah, once not I, yet, not yet. But yeah. One, yeah, once I get to the percentage, because I've never done that, right? Mm-hmm. I've always just oh, I feel like you know, this today, and I lift that, mm-hmm. and the, and I also. If I put a weight on the bar, and even if I say I'm going to lift eight, but I put too much weight, I might do five. Like that's how. Where this, I'm going to be very calculated about it. You want to follow exactly? Exactly. Yeah, that that was my plan, and so I was like trying to get. I don't even have two and a half. You know, like I never like had that mentality towards it, but I I want to try it out. No, me me too. You saw like uh, my deadlift. That's why you see me uh, at the end. I shake my head because I'm kind of pissed because that was supposed to be. uh, I wanted ten. But I was supposed to do at least eight reps right there, and it was my grip that gave. Oh. I couldn't get I couldn't get eight because I was a, I was losing the bar. The, Did you have your alternate grip? No, I had double oh, over. Oh yeah, dude, you got alternate three. No, well, I'm trying to I'm trying to I'm trying to do it double over and and build that that way without yeah. without any straps or anything. At least why I'm working in the high rep range. Maybe when I get down to mm-hmm. you know down to like fives and singles and stuff like that, maybe I'll do. So what'd you pull with your double overhand grip? Uh, 360 something for oh, seven. Yeah. Well, that's not, it's pretty damn good for your grip. Yeah. I know it's, it, it's already getting no hook grip. No. Yeah. That's pretty damn good, dude. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's getting there. I mean, yeah. I want to, I want to be pulling over 400 like that yeah. with double over for sure. Um, without having to yeah. go to, a I, uh, I'm jealous cause I can't start yet. I, my QL, I tweaked it, you know, like last week. Remember I told you guys yeah. I was working out and I, I tweaked it a little bit and <clears throat> It's still not feeling great, so I've just. In fact, this morning I woke up late because I went to change my um, my alarm clock, and I must have or excuse me, my clock because of the time change, and I messed, I fucked up and didn't set my alarm. So this morning I woke up like 35 minutes later than I normally would, and I had to work out this morning. So and I remember this happening when I was a trainer. So it doesn't really piss me off like it used to. 
Because back in the day, if I knew my workout was being cut short, I was just angry. Like, oh, everything's ruined. <laughs> but years ago, as a, as a trainer, I remember this happened to me once, and then I realized the value of it. I don't, I'm sure this happened to you before, where you're like, you think you have an hour to work out after you're finished with your client. Yeah. You finished with your client, you look at, the, you look at your, your schedule or whatever, and you're like, ah, oh, shit. I got to be here. I have 30 minutes. Damn it. I don't have an hour. So what I did is, is I would just take my hour workout and do it all in 30 minutes, and I would rest for 25 to 30 seconds in between sets. And you have to cut the weight way down, yeah. but you get the most amazing pump ever. And every once in a while, that kind of a change in a workout actually gets your body to respond. So that's what I did this morning. That, that's how I actually love to do hit or 25-minute type work. I don't like to uh, actually program it. They're just, there always tends to, be, it tends to be a day like that. Yes. There always tends to be a day where I thought I'd have more time mm-hmm. or, what, or I've got to go out of town and it's like, shit, I don't have time to get a long hour, hour and a half type of workout and shower and all this. I got 25, 30 minutes. Like, what a perfect time for. And because you don't do that consistently, it always, it always throws your. Oh, your body. This, so this morning's workout, I did an hour workout in just under 35 minutes. It, I th- had supersets. I went a lot lighter. Um, my my rest periods were shorter. Amazing pump. Amazing workout. And it always reminds me of the value of novelty. You know what I mean? Just changing things. I did a post over the weekend on on what's the best rep range. And, um, you know, and this, this just goes to show the value of, uh, of experience, because if you're just knowledgeable about the studies that are out there on rep ranges, the clear answer would be eight to 12 reps, clear answer, eight to 12 reps is the best rep range. Yeah. That's what studies show. But experience tells me it's what you're not doing. It's mm-hmm. yeah, that all the rep ranges build muscle, especially if it's the rep range you've not, you're not training in. So what's the best rest period for building muscle and strength? Probably around one to two minutes, maybe even three minutes. But I know that because typically I rest about one, one and a half to two minutes, the fact that this morning I was able to only rest 25 or 30 minutes, that sent- 30 seconds. Yeah, or 30, excuse me, 30 seconds. It sent a phenomenal muscle building signal because of the novelty. And you're not going to find studies on that, unfortunately, because the studies are never, you know, never long. Anyway, speaking of Instagram, uh, this morning I had uh, probably 10 people share with me a, I'm not going to call this person out, but- a, a fitness or health influencers post um, recently. And I think it's because uh, this person's post was kind of counter to their message, what they've always said before. Mm. So what the, what the post was, uh, and I'm not going to call this person out because I actually think they're, they're doing something good for themselves, or at least the, 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 the direction they're moving is good for them. But it was that they are going to not have sex anymore oh. for like six months. I saw that. So they're going to be abstinent. For six months. And this is a person that is typically talks about, you know, how much sex they have and how great it is. And, you know, a lot of stuff revolves around that. Open relationship. Yeah. And and people were sharing it with me. Like, I think they anticipated I'd go on there and make fun of this person. But you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the journey that people have with uh, nutrition or with exercise. Like, how many times have you worked with a client who comes to you and is like, that's it. I can't handle it anymore. This weekend I eat like crazy. I drink like crazy. That's it. No sugar, no alcohol. And I, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to stay away from those things at least for the next yeah. six months or I'm, I'm avoiding them for a year or whatever. Yeah. How many times have you heard that right. happen? And, it, and then as you, as we all know, that's just another form of dysfunction. It's another way of, you're just going one extreme to the other, but it's kind of like bouncing off the rails before you start to find the middle mm-hmm. or or it turns into more pathology, which is uh, restrict binge, restrict binge, restrict binge. You're like, I'm not, I am, I'm not, I'm, I am. Right. But, you know, I was thinking about fasting uh, and what fasting did for me, for food. When I, when I chose to try fasting, it wasn't because I was sick and tired of eating terrible food or being fat or anything like that. It was because I read studies that showed that there may be benefits, there may be health benefits. I wanted to experiment with it. I, up until this point, I had eaten six to eight meals a day. And when I fasted, I actually learned a lot from it. Abstinence in that case taught me quite a bit. Like I realized how I wasn't controlled and chained to food, like, or at least it didn't have the control and power over me like it did before. So this person maybe might experience that. They may go, you know, six months without sex and realize. Timing wise is all the no nut November sort of a a movement that that we're seeing everywhere. Yeah. What's that? What is that all about? I don't know. So it's... (laughs) Again, no, not November. Yeah, who came up with this? Like, it, so a bunch of guys like not looking at porn, not having sex, not masturbating, all that kind of stuff. It's all November. 
Like yeah. this is the, the the lame month. You know what I, I think guess. that comes from? I think that's a little bit of a, a self regulation that has happened sure. online because of the uh, accessibility of pornography. Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah. I mean, I'm all for it, like, but it's just funny because it's like we need like a designated month for like all all these things. We can't just like implement it into our own lives, like on our own, and not like be a part of like everybody in this group mentality thing. Yeah. Well, you know how people are. Yeah. They need like a a structure and a thing sometimes yeah. to get to do it at first, and it that stuff just doesn't work on me at all. No. <laughs> Like, oh, everybody's doing it? Oh, fuck you guys. Yeah. Like, I'm, yeah. kicking, I, I'm going I'm kicking up hyper my drive. <laughs> yeah. Justin's doing overtime. The, yeah, yeah, dude. He's doing a three oh, three nut. I'll be the only guy in Pornhub, I guess, this <laughs> month. <laughs> you know what's funny? I wonder if because Pornhub keeps crazy statistics. You ever seen the statistics that they spit oh, out? They must get like a like like a drop. Well, they'll something. they'll tell you like uh the most popular porn by state, the times a day most people are on there, how many men, how many women. Uh, and, uh, what, what, what happened recently where uh, I would imagine to your, your point and your theory of what you're talking about right now, though, it would actually end up only benefiting them because probably people would restrict and then binge and then binge like crazy. Yeah, you know exactly. what I'm saying? Go from not at all to all of a sudden like, ah, yeah. now I need it four hours. You guys, <laughs> you guys remember that one, there was that one missile scare. It was like a, a in yeah, Hawaii. was that in Hawaii? Yeah, yeah. I remember that. And like people were like literally going into like sewers or whatever, or like, like, like climbing into trenches and like, like all scared. Yeah. I forgot what it was. It was like a news report that there was a missile launch. It turned out to be false, but everybody totally panicked for like oh, that was thirty the, minutes or that an hour. was the warning that they the radio station accidentally played. Yes, yeah, that was yes, crazy. So, so Pornhub showed a significant drop. Oh, yeah, that's right. A it significant drop in porn use right when that happened. But then when everybody realized there was no uh, oh, there's no problem. Yes, spike M massive surge. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Yeah. yeah, everything's okay. Yeah. We're okay. I'm gonna celebrate. <laughs> put the porn, put the porn uh, on. Well, speaking of stations and things like that, did you guys see what? NBC is launching their new e-commerce site. What? So it's going to be on the on NBC is going to be start doing this first, and you'll you'll see uh, like the way they're going to do commercials. And I think what it's going to look like if I if I was reading the article correctly, it's kind of similar to like how we do on YouTube, where it shrinks and then you have kind of an advertising. It, oh, I see. But then there'll be a QR code on the TV that you can walk up to your phone and scan it. It takes you right to the e-commerce site. Huh. So think of an advertisement mm -hmm. for you know your your favorite whatever sneakers or shirt or Viore right Viore brand pops up and you're like oh I like that shirt with that and then right next to it will be a QR code you just walk like up a discount or something yeah yeah twenty percent off right now on this or that and you'll walk up scan your phone on the QR code and take then, a picture of it or whatever right not even just you know what a QR code is yeah right? yeah, yeah, yeah yeah just you, your phone picks it up. And oh, that's right. It's a square thing. with the Yeah, yeah. And then it automatically will send you right to the website. You know what I feel like? I feel like at some point there's going to be, uh, if you keep your phone on Bluetooth, it'll just come on and you'll get an invitation. Would you like a $25 off coupon on your phone? And if you turn off Bluetooth, you don't get it. Or if you have it on, I feel like that'd be easier, right? I don't know. Than that's, having to walk up. Yeah. I don't know if, if, if it'll be a Bluetooth thing that'll be like that. Normally when you go on to like websites now, you notice that you they ask you right away if you can if uh, they can have access, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times you agree to that as soon as you go to a website. So I'm sure maybe after the first time you hit the QR code, then it's like, mm -hmm. can we access? So is this send is you it, notifications? Right? Is this a site specifically? To that NBC owns, where they're going to be selling things online. Is yes. that what's going on? So I think uh, what I think what will happen is I think NBC. This will be one of the ways that they make money. Uh, is they'll make a cut, like so. I, and I don't know, this is me speculating because the article didn't go in real depth, like exactly how NBC makes their money. But what I would assume is you would work out a deal with advertising. So we know that advertising on television and radio has been taking a nosedive, right? Mm -hmm. Podcasting and spaces like this and social media has been on the rise. So my theory would be one of the ways that you would save deals with these companies is offering you know, like a company like Pepsi, who's used to spending millions of dollars on t television, but have seen it decrease over years and is now probably looking at other platforms or mediums for them to advertise on, they can probably offer them a discounted rate or, hey, you, you could still advertise on TV. We're going to be doing this e-commerce site this way. But then NBC will probably make some sort of a kickback because you go through their their e-commerce site. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. So now Pepsi, instead of paying a million dollars to NBC to advertise on that, they only pay, you know, a quarter million dollars. But then NBC makes a 
five percent kickback on everything that goes through that or something. I don't know. That would be my that would be my guess on how they would control. It is that. interesting to hmm. watch how advertisers are having to figure out. You know what I mean? How to get to people. Get into the streaming yeah, side of things. Because yeah. you used to be forced to watch commercials, which is funny thinking about it now. It's funny. Have you tried, Justin, have you tried ever watching like live TV with your kids and just see what their reaction is? Katrina oh, won't even watch they it. They get angry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Katrina <laughs> does too. Sit there. It's like you're held hostage, oh. you know? You're just like waiting. Is this over yet? You know, especially when there's like a movie playing on TV. They go all out, dude. They hammer you with advertising. Yeah, they do, right? But you don't, re- you don't realize how yeah. like how used to it we were and now oh, how yeah. used to it we... We used to just sit through that. Or I would go make myself something in the kitchen and be like, is it on again? You know, you'd have to wait forever. It doesn't bother me as much because I, whenever I'm watching kind of like, unless it's a movie, I'm but if it's a movie I'm really into, I'm buying it. I'm buying it on Apple or I'm exactly. watching it on Netflix or whatever that. So if it's on television, that te- TV time now for me is like, like, past time where I'm working most of the time. So you're doing both. Yeah, I'm doing both. So commercials don't bother me, but this is like a this is actually a little battle in our house. Like hmm. Katrina gets hella mad when commercials come on. And that's the other thing too. Commercials are they 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 jump them up volume too. Oh yeah. So you'll be watching like a, a movie and then all of a sudden the commercial oh, comes on. I'm the on. guy that mutes it right. So away. that's what she yeah. she's always getting on to me. Mute it, mute it. And I'm like on my phone working and I'm like, ah, here you take it. You mute it. I don't care. It doesn't bother me. I, I forgot I, that commercials did that. Yeah. Yeah. They come you know how they do that, right? Because there's there's regulations that say that the they're not allowed to uh, change the volume or whatever, but the way they do is by compressing the sound. So they figure out a way around regulations to make commercials louder. I remember yeah. reading Ugh. about that a long time. ago. Yeah, they're always yeah, they're obnoxious. always louder. At least on my TV, they're they're significantly louder than what the actual movie so or whatever annoying. you're watching. Yeah, you're all watching a quiet movie, the baby sleeping and shit. Commercial. Comes That's on. why she's yeah. always getting on to me about. It. So I just give her the remote. and I'm like, if we're watching, she am wow. Yeah. <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> yeah. My ears. I'm like this though. I just deaf eared. I'm on my yeah, phone, yeah. Yeah. you know, doing something. You know what's funny is that thinking back, back in the day, there was even a piece of of me that uh, valued the commercial because it gave me an opportunity. Because you couldn't record or pause TV, so it's like, oh, commercial, cool. I got to pee. Yeah, yeah. But now that I can pause it, I'm like, well, fine. There's no it's use like for little this. intermissions. Yeah. yeah, there's no use for this commercial. I know. Turn yeah. this shit off. <laughs> anyway, weird. dude, I was reading about um, this weekend. I was I did a workout on did an extra workout on Saturday, and then I did. The whole sauna, you know, over at uh, what is what's that place? It's not Club Sport anymore. It's a uh, bake. Oh. Is it Bay Club? Yeah, Bay Club. Is that what it's called now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. They, they're the new owners. Great mm. place. Anyway, I'm in the sauna, and um, because I'm in there, I I think God, I want to read more about the the, the the history of saunas. I didn't realize this, but sauna use, uh, the heating up a room and sitting in it in that room to benefit from the the heat, that dates back over a thousand years in Europe and in other parts of the world. There's evidence that it goes back even further. And it's funny, anytime you find something that's shared by people in cultures that didn't communicate with each other, Mm -hmm. like if you see, for example, fasting, you find that in every major religion. You'll find it in Asian cultures. You'll find it in European cultures. You'll find, you know, just it's practiced everywhere. That means that there's some truth to it. Same thing with sauna use. Uh, oh yeah, like it, it, Romans, isn't there like Russian bathhouses and all these types of? And well, it's a, even and it's a part of culture. Like the like the Mayans were doing it forever too. Like in the what do they call them? They call them like hot tents or whatever. Where they they like keep the heating. They right. they heat. They progressively heat it up over time. Yeah, Katrina's gone and done it. They yeah. go every time they go to Mexico. They go. Down yeah, what is that yeah. called, Doug? That's called. I forget uh, what it's called. Sweat they, lodge. There you go. Yeah, Sweat that's lodge. what they call them now, right? So so anyway, so obviously there's value to it. And we now have studies that support the value of, you know, training your body through heat because it gets your body it, it causes changes in the body, the adaptations that you get from the changes or from the stress or what, where you gain the benefit. So I was reading a study on that was done on athletes because now we have some studies done on on athletes. Like what are the actual benefits of sauna use on athletic performance? There was a study in the Journal of Science and Medicine and Sport. They took distance runners and they had them use uh, sauna saunas for three weeks uh, total. So, and there was a total of twelve half-hour sauna sessions in that three-week uh, period. So, it's not a ton of sauna use. It's so just, four times a week. Yeah, four times a week, thirty minutes each. Their time to exhaustion, in other words, their endurance, yeah, boosted thirty-two percent. Wow. Wow, that's substantial. That's, that's not a little bit. Yeah. That's a massive boost uh, in stamina and endurance. Now, I noticed this myself right. when I use the sauna regularly. And think about this. When you're exercising to exhaustion, when you're pushing yourself that hard, 
It's what usually if, the heat that's uh, the big indicator, right? Heat that's, that's plays what, a role. Yeah, your whole body starts to kind of shut down and be fatigued and be like down regulate. When I use the sauna regularly, um, I can squat more reps. I could, don't need to rest as much, but the end of my workout is way stronger than it, than it is if I don't use a sauna. Um, and that study right there kind of now that's just, oh, yeah, go ahead. And that's just benefits from a, a regular sauna. Then you throw in the fact of like what I love and you were at Bay this weekend. I was in here this weekend using, um, our clear light. Cause that thing, you get the infrared on oh, top yeah, of that. So yeah, you get yeah. the benefits, the heat benefits you're talking about, but then you also get the benefits from the infrared cause it has near and far infrared in there. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, a double whammy. It I, is. I, I, I love it. It's been one of my, like. And it's 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 easy for me. Obviously, we have it in our studio, so it makes it a lot easier. But it's like one of my favorite things to do post workout. Dude, it's it is yeah. okay. Think of it this way, okay? Think of your body's ability to acclimate to cold or hot. Because by the way, there's also benefits, uh, and, and studies support this quite conclusively to also getting your body used to cold. But think of your body's ability to acclimate to heat or cold as a muscle. So imagine if you have this muscle that is responsible for your body's ability to acclimate to temperature changes. Now think about the way you live, okay? You're in air-conditioned or heated home, air-conditioned or heated car, air-conditioned or heated office. So it's literally like being extremely sedentary for this muscle. And what happens when you're sedentary? Imagine if you barely ever move your legs, what happens to the muscles of those legs? They get really, really weak. They lose their ability to uh, to do what they're supposed to do. And that comes along with poor health. So I think the health benefits that come from heat and, and cold therapy are, part of it is the benefits because you're stressing your body, but part of it is because we're so damn weak in that area. Right. You just become more resilient to, to all these forces. against. Uh, and I, I look at that as like a Wim Hof or somebody that goes to that extreme of uh, being more tolerant, can function like normally. In Arctic temperatures. Yep. And, and that's, that's, it seems like a superpower, but really that's just a training that led into that. Dude, it's so funny. So I, years ago, I, I owned uh, part of a gym down in um, Palm Desert, which is next to Palm Springs. Desert. It's hot as shit in the summer, 120 degrees. It would hit super, super hot, right? Mm-hmm. So I had a gym down there, super hot all the time. It took me a little while to get used to it, but then I kind of got used to it. Came up to San Jose to visit my family. And everybody was complaining about how hot it was. And it was 89 or 90 up here. And I remember going outside and being like, oh, it's like, pleasant. What are you talking about? Yeah, totally used to it. Totally used to it. Then I thought, then I think about, I had a client who uh, moved here from Minnesota and I started training her. And I remember she showed up to her. It was literally 48 degrees or 50 degrees outside here in California. And she wore like shorts. She had shorts on and this really thin kind of long sleeve shirt. And I'm like, aren't you freezing? And she's like, "What do you mean the cl- the sky? You know, the sky is clear. It's a beautiful Dude, day." That's how I felt coming back from Chicago. Yeah, it was yeah. crazy because, like, I was at a, a football game. I remember watching a high school game, and everybody was out there with like parkas on and like uh, you know beanies and everything. And I was just like a short sleeve and in, in, in pants because I was experiencing thirty below and just like shivering, fucking like crazy out there. And then coming back was a totally different story. Well, you guys talk about the benefits of being able to acclimate to hot and cold. The biggest thing that I noticed and. I've talked about on the show when we've brought up sauna use before is when we really got into that whole hot cold contrast, which has now been I don't know what four years. When we 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 were at the other studio, at least a few years. It was the other studio when we first started talking about. Yes, it. yeah. And like cryo yeah. came out and was all yes. When popular. yeah, it was when cryo was getting popular. We went and did it was the other studio we were at, and that's when I started doing the hot cold thing. And boy, I have since then, it's just been something that it's, it, I keep it in my routine. I don't ever go longer than a month without doing the hot call contrast. Mm-hmm. And I've never felt so good as far as uh, not getting sick. Oh, yeah. I used to get sick and colds all the fucking time. Oh, mm-hmm. this is well documented. Yeah. This is actually well documented. There are studies that show significant reductions in infection rates with a cold or influenza. Now, as a... Uh, and here's an, here's another strategy. Let's say you start to feel, you know, you start to feel like, oh, I wonder if I'm, I think I might be getting a little sick. Go in a sauna yep. and get your body really hot. Now, now people think, well, how is that supposed to help? Well, think about the function of a fever. Why does your body have a fever when you get sick? That increase in body temperature, part of it is a result of your, your mounted immune system, but part of it is also it's inhospitable to, uh, to bacteria and a virus. 
So going into a sauna is an artificial fever. So you start to feel sick, go use a sauna. And of course, make sure you're hydrated. Make, and you don't want to be full-blown sick and do this, by the way. You're not going to go in there with 102 you know, <laughs> fever and then decide to go into a sauna. You don't want to add a fever to yeah, a fever. It's too late at that point. You're not going to go in there. You know. But let's say you're, you're feeling like, oh, I think I might be getting yeah, sick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy, it's a killer. Yeah. It kills whatever's going on. I've done it several times, and it's amazing to me how amazing uh, I feel. Anyway, yeah. oh, I wanted to touch on something. You know how last week we talked about that haunted well, house? Get your hands away from me. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Boom. Yeah. Uh, you know how we talked about that haunted house last week that offered $20,000? Yeah, yeah. We need. <laughs> we, we watched need, some videos for that, too. We need to tell the audience oh, exactly man. what this is all about. Dude. So oh, we, we didn't talk about it afterwards. No, no, no. no. Oh. What it all entails. Like, Stupid. Uh, makes sense now. Yeah, it's not even like a real haunted house to me. It is literally no. people that are seeking out like... It's BDSM or whatever. No, what are they called? You're, you're a masochist, right? Yeah, totally. Masochist. Yeah, the, the people that are into that, that just want to be totally tortured. That's what it is. It's a 10-hour, 8 or 10-hour... Torture set. ...process. So I read more details. $20,000 if you make it through. Every time you don't, uh, you take you say pass on a whatever they call it. They call it a stunt, but it's basically a type of torture. They fine you five hundred dollars. So out of the twenty twenty thousand oh, dollars, I see. Right? If you don't make it all the way through, you don't get the twenty thousand dollars either. There's a forty page uh, waiver that you have to sign, and what you're signing away is that they can cut your hair, slap yeah. you, punch pull you, pull a tooth out, pull a tooth out, break yeah. your tooth, yeah, dislocate toenails, your toenails, shoulders, yep, shave your head. They're, I mean, they were doing all yeah, kinds they, of. They could just mangle you, dude. I think that the guy who put it together is just a fucking freak, and he's like, "How do I do this legally?" Oh yeah. yeah, you know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. No, you. We were watching some of the clips. You could see the people going through it. They, they, He's no like one laughing about none it. Of, none of the people that went through it. So originally, when we talked about it, it was like a haunted house, twenty grand. I would do that, yeah, right? I yeah. wouldn't do that. No, I wouldn't do that. And it's the the people that are doing it. You don't even hear them talking about. Oh, I almost made it to the money. They don't give a shit about the money. No, they just, just like want to get tortured, hammered. Oh, yeah, it's disgusting. Yeah, Stupid. and it's not even like the <laughs> like the house. It's just a house. You know, and like there's kids just like doing this, and then they take them to like the back room. Yeah, you know, no. and just just torture. Stupid, them. stupid. Oh, you know, like, dude, this isn't a haunted house. There's this a petition. Uh, bullshit. There's a petition online right now to to ban, ban them. This. Yeah, because yeah. people are like, this is legal torture. Where do you stand on this? Because everybody, the people agree to do it. I mean, the they, people they doing it agree. want to do it. I mean, isn't that weird? It's like you yeah. can't. I mean, can you really ban that? They want to do it. To and there was other. a waiting list of what was it like seventy thousand people or something what? crazy? Yeah. No. Yeah. Dude. Well, think about it this way. Let's say you're into that weird shit. Where are you going to go? He's yeah. got the market cornered. You know what I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of Halloween stuff, did you see the Airbnb thing here in California? No, what happened? Yeah, five murders in a. Uh, oh so, my god! So what? somebody that was at an Airbnb. I saw that on the news. Yeah, so they're they're and air and of course it's been made big news, and now Airbnb is trying to pivot and figure it a way out to keep this from happening, uh, and so they're they're cracking down on just which sucks for people like us who use Airbnb and VRBO quite a bit. Uh, just how you could, how to, they're going to restrict certain people and I guess more screening just to get to rent a house. So the person who rented the house, you know, claimed that oh my, uh, they're trying to get away from the fires and that their family was going to come to rent this big house out or whatever like that. And so you know, Airbnb rents the house out. Well, they end up throwing a hundred plus person party at this this house. And oh, there wow. ends up get a shooting happens and five people were shot and killed. Uh, at this Airbnb property. You imagine having a property, Man. putting on an Airbnb, and some fucker rents your house and throws a party with 100 people? Yeah. Oh, uh, people will get shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's why some, someone got shot. You yeah, know? yeah. Sure was the owner showed up. Yeah. <laughs> crazy, though, right? Get the fuck Get out. off my lawn. Yeah. So crazy. Oh, dude, I read... Uh, this is this is kind of disturbing. I want to sh share this with you guys because it's, it's pretty crazy. I'm, I actually wrote down the quote. So this was a study that um, was done on uh, cancer. And uh, it was done by North Carolina State University. And they found that when enteric glial cells are exposed to secretions from colon tumors, so these are Sounds brain hot. these are brain cells. So brain cells ex exposed to the secretions that colon tumors, so tumors from the colon, make, the glial cells convert into promoters of tumor growth. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that the cancers in the colon are signaling the brain to help them make more cancers. Wow. It's like they take over the fucking body, dude. Oh, this is why cancer man. is such a hard thing to, to treat. 
You know wow. what I mean? It's like you kill one thing and it does another thing. And there was, I remember one time reading a study where Dang. they developed a drug because they, they, when tumors grow, they start to develop their own, uh, they increase the amount of nutrients that they receive to feed themselves more. So it's like they'll make more blood vessels and whatever to continue to feed their, their, their rapid growth. So I remember reading the study where they came out with a medicine that blocked the, the new formation of blood cells and stuff like that to see, you know, of, of, of uh, you know, these, these blood vessels. Mm. Like, there we go. We'll cut them off. Well, the fucking tumors figured out a way around it and created their own other bastards. Yeah, dude. Isn't that crazy? Wow. Such yeah. a complex problem. Cancer, wow. you know, just goes to highlight that. Yikes. All right. First question is from Ben Vanna. Is there a difference between training with bands or cables? Oh, yeah, there's a big difference. Uh, the benefits of training with a resistance band... So here's the thing. The benefits of training with any form of resistance is typically the unique aspect of that form of resistance that you don't find with other types of, of resistance. Well, so you're, you're manipulating the strength curve. Yes. So bands, what are bands unique for? Why are bands different? Bands, the further you stretch them out... The harder it gets. The harder they pull. So how is that? So it's very different than a cable. A cable... But we have to explain that real quick. So in what I said about manipulating the strength curve, what that means is most exor most exercises are, are easier at the end of the rep, right? So towards the end, where a band flips that on its head. As you get further at the, towards the end of the rep, the band's being stretched out completely. And so, that the, so then it now makes the exercise more challenging at the end of the rep, more so than it would be if you didn't have a band. Yeah, so think of it this way. If you're doing, let's say you're doing a barbell squat, it's going to be hardest at the bottom of the squat. Mm -hmm. It's easiest when you're almost at the very top, right? Like if I gave you a bunch of weight to squat and you just went down three inches, wouldn't be a problem. Try to sit down with that, that weight and come up and you're probably not going to make it up. So by attaching bands to the bar, the bottom of the, the squat is still kind of easy because the band hasn't stretched that much. But as you go up, the band stretches and it gets more and more difficult, applying more resistance when you're stronger. And this, adding bands to weights was an absolute breakthrough for power lifters and strength athletes. And that was a West Side Barbell, right? They were the first ones to really implement this. But Soviet athletes were the, were the ones to... You know how Soviet athletes messed with variable resistance at first? Mm. It was with... Uh, uh, the little thing that looks the hooks, and, yeah. then you, and then it dumps when you drop it down? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember, I, remember thinking, I think I watched a documentary on that, and they talked about that. I saw... You know, uh, Ben Pollock was using those the other day. I saw... I hadn't seen anybody else use those before. I didn't even, never seen anyone else. And they have the hooks, and it, you, a lot, it was common with you know bench or squat... And they're, it's designed that when you hit the bottom, it unhooks so you can come so out. So you lower mm. 500 pounds, but you yeah. only squat up 400. Right. Because that lowering part, you're strong. Yeah, I like for deadlifts, they have that flexible bar. So that way when you're pulling from the ground, you're starting to like rip like each plate off one by one. Oh, and, and right. So, yeah, it, it kind of like builds up the resistance as you get higher up in your lockout. It is a lot harder to deadlift with a super stiff bar. I remember what, first time doing that, and I didn't realize why. I'm like, why is this so much harder? Yeah. <laughs> it's because you're lifting all the weight right away. All at once. Yeah. Rather than moving up an inch or whatever yeah, without, it's pretty ingenious. without the whole no it's it's uh bands are an exceptional tool and it I, I didn't use bands until the way later in my training i never used bands. i used to think bands were a complete waste of time when i would when i was working out like bands that's for people who don't have access to weights like that's stupid why are you gonna work yeah. out with bands? well it didn't that's for jazzercise i did not what i didn't understand that's why i wanted to clarify that for those that are listening is uh, i didn't understand how it was manipulating the strength curve and why that's important because unless you're doing that you can't really match you can't the, tell yeah you just can't but cables now cables are consistent all the way through right right so the resistance that you get with a cable at the at the bottom of the of the the exercise and the top of the exercise it's consistent all this it's matching the strength curve all the way through where most other exercises that you're doing that are free weight, uh, there's going to be this natural strength curve that happens as you get towards the end of the rep. It becomes a lot easier, but by adding bands to those, it, it flips that on its head. Yeah, now, now, if you were to compare bands versus cables alone, cables are superior. Consistent resistance by itself in comparison to the band type of resistance will build more muscle. But... Bands, I will say this. Less damaging. Yeah, I, yes, they're less damaging on the body. That's why I love them so much. Like yeah. in MAPS Anabolic, uh, I recommended bands for trigger sessions. Trigger sessions are these little mini short workouts you do on your off days and you do them super frequently. And I noticed when I use bands, 
they just worked much better. And it was because they produced less damage. They didn't hurt my muscles as much as if I used weights. And plus, like a lot of these like athletic moves, I prefer bands just because of that fact that you know you can you can get explosive with the bands and they're gonna like stretch. Uh, with your movement and get like gradually more intense like the harder you push so it's like it, it sort of matches that like explosive feel that uh, you can get with these uh, like power moves. here's a little trick by the way if you want to do an explosive movement with a cable one of the drawbacks to do an explosive movement with a cable is you have to it do an explosive jumps a little yeah to do an explosive move with a cable you're, you're going to use a weight that's sub maximal because otherwise you can't move very fast yeah. the problem with that is you throw the weight stack up and it flips everywhere and it makes a lot of noise and it's not good for the machine. So here's a little trick. Take the the pin that sticks out of the, the weight, attach a band to that, and, it, and then anchor the band on the floor. And it keeps the – it allows you to move the weight super fast but prevents the weight from flopping all over the place. Mm. And I started doing this. This is back when I was in, in jiu-jitsu and judo. And I'm uh -huh. like, God, I, you know, I want to practice explosive throws. I don't have a partner. I want to use the cables. The problem is if I fling the weight, it's going to flip it's all over the place. Yeah, so I attach bands – brilliant way to uh, apply explosiveness now is there a value for bands for people who don't give a shit about getting super strong or or don't care about explosive power and sure. just want to build muscle totally in fact now you're for rehab too you're, you're starting to see bodybuilders now use bands. i don't think they know how to use them <laughs> you know properly or whatever but i'll tell you what if you use bands in your training and you're relatively advanced you're going to build uh more muscle it's one of my favorite things that i that i add to my training arsenal Next question is from Ella Beasley. What are the best weighted exercises for building abs? We have a guide uh, on training your abs, and we talk a lot about you know weighted exercises and how best to build uh, you know abs that show. So this is uh, it's a free guide; doesn't cost anything. It's at mindpumpfree.com. We'll make sure that we link it. But in terms of this question here, okay, why would anybody first off want to build their abs? Um, this is something that I learned later on again in my training career. I was one of those people that I had to get to seven or eight percent body fat to have a six pack. I just I don't store body fat on my arms or my legs. They're almost always lean. But if I do, it's right on my abs. And I just I was not one of those guys that at ten percent had a six pack. I had to get lower than that. And even then, when I was relaxed, I didn't have I, I was always envious of those guys that had abs or girls that had abs that you could see when they were relaxed. You know what I mean? They're just walking around with their shirt off and you could see their abs stick out a little bit. And I was like, man, I wish I had that. And I couldn't figure it out. I was doing high rep exercises and, you know, twists and all these crunches and it just wasn't working. Then I realized, why don't I build them? Like if, if they get a little bigger, they'll stick out more. So that's what I did. I started doing weighted exercises for my abs and they stuck out more to the point now where I have a visible six pack around 10 or 11%. So I don't need to get quite as lean to have those abs show. Now the question is what are the best weighted exercises? By far, one of my favorite is a good old fashioned decline sit up. Just do a decline sit up, curl your way up real slow and you'll feel those abs build. And it's because the reps are really low. So now to, to that, uh, I think it's important to talk about the importance of first making sure that you have good mechanics with abs oh, yeah. because- uh, in fact, I got tagged on um, the guys over at Squat University did a, a post, and I think they uh, the post said something along the lines that that uh, crunches were a waste of a time, waste of time, and um, for most most people are are either hurting themselves or not doing it correctly. And somebody was like, you know, send it right away. Of course, I get tagged or that stuff sent to me. And I said, well, I, I haven't read the post. I don't know w what he exactly is talking about, um, but I could make a case for why crunches can be worthless for some people. Some people, uh, in, fact, in fact, when I think about my average client, I would have to say that more than half of them uh, did not do uh, crunches correctly. Uh, most of them uh, were so hip flexor dominant uh, that they were using more of their hip flexors to crunch up or sit up in an exercise. And so if you have really poor mechanics uh, or have or you struggle with feeling uh, ab exercises in your abs and then you go and load it, Ugh, you're, you're going to hurt your back. Yeah, you're going to end up hurt. And that, that's what it actually what the statement was, was that crunches uh, hurt uh, hurt more people's backs than I think that they help people build abs or something along those lines. And so, you know, and, and 
Sal alluded to our free guide. It addresses that, talks that in there. We also have great videos on our YouTube channel that we talk about addressing that if you have hip flexor dominance and, and how to uh, work on that before you do abs. But that's important. It's important that you get really good non-weighted control of your abs and you can and you can feel your abs working because I can make a a perfect sit up and and fail at like five reps by just going slow and controlled and slowly rolling each vertebrae down as I open up and make that extremely difficult and challenging for five to seven reps before I load it. And I think too, like this is one of those muscle groups that commonly like people lose connection with. Mm -hmm. And so it's very easy to think that just going through the the range of motion that you think is preferable for a crunch or uh, that just like a hanging ab, you know, leg raise is going to start building that back up again. But you don't have that like connection established to where you're actually directing the work to the abs. And so to, to establish that again is is paramount before adding load, much like any other muscle or anything else that you've you're probably more familiar with, like in a curl, if I'm not if I'm not feeling my bicep get involved, you're, you're, you're probably going to try and stop and figure that out. So, uh, yeah. So here's the problem though. People do feel their abs, but they're not working their abs. Their abs are as a stabilizer, but not working them right, through a full right. range of motion. In fact, you take the average person, have them stand up straight and just tell them to do pelvic tilts. See if they can do that. See if they can articulate right, their just pelvis. Bracing. Yeah, just take their pelvis and go from sticking their butt out to tucking their tailbone without you know having to use their hips. Just articulate that and they still can't do it. Um, this is super obvious when you see people do leg raises. Watch someone do a leg raise, especially the one where you brace your arms at the bottom and you bring their knees up. And what they're doing is they're just using their hip flexors. So you have to understand what the abs do. The abs, when they contract, they fold you at your lumbar spine, not at your hips. And that's the thing. The average person watches a person yeah, fold. They, they look very similar if you don't know what you're looking that's for. That's right. They just see someone fold forward and they say, oh, that's an ab. You can fold forward at the hips and not, not fold forward at the lumbar. Mm -hmm. So it's really about working through that lumbar, getting the lumbar spine to uh, flex and then extend. That's what the abs do, not at the hips. Yeah. So once you figure that out, then you can start to add resistance. In fact, most people just doing that will give them all the resistance they need. Oh yeah, I mean even myself. I, no, I, I I openly admit that I probably neglect my ab training more than anything else. We've talked about this before, and so I know when I kick it back up. I mean, my abs are so weak that a doing five to seven like perfect sit-ups is so much load. Sure. You know, just me rolling up the spine and slowly sitting up, I mean, that, that'll blast my abs within yeah. five to seven reps. So, you know, it, it doesn't take much uh, when you do it correctly. Now, if you're somebody who's been training your abs and you have, you've got great control of it and you can do, you know, 15, 20 perfect sit-ups, no problem, then okay, well then... You know, loading it, I think, is is totally fine and encouraged and a good idea because a lot of people don't do that. And to, I would agree with Sal with what, what, what exercise I would start with. Next question is from More Jojo. Why is the compete and cheat mentality with food so common among bodybuilding athletes? Do you think athletes in other sports have a better relationship with food than bodybuilders? Okay, so so great, great, great question. Also not fair. Okay, so, so I'll explain why, okay? If we're going to compare bodybuilders to any other space in terms of uh, you know food relationships, you can't compare bodybuilders to athletes. Bodybuilders are judged on how they look, not how they perform. Now, compare bodybuilders to models, okay? Look at models, look at bodybuilders. What you find is a similar pathology- Yeah, yeah almost identical. With oh, yeah. nutrition. Very, very similar. The problem is- uh, two things. One, bodybuilding attracts people who tend to have insecurities with how they look. But forget that for a second. If you're hardcore about bodybuilding, you are competing in a sport that is basing everything on how you look. Athletes, on the other hand, sure, especially if you're professional, how you look is kind of important for sponsorships. But really, it's about how you perform. Yeah. It's all about performance. The reason why athletes have a better general, and I'll, I'll agree with that, I think athletes have a generally a better relationship with food than bodybuilders is because it's all based on performance. This is why doing a program like MAPS Powerlift for somebody who has body image issues is brilliant. Yeah. It's absolutely brilliant. Takes your body, your mind off of how you look. And is that going to benefit your relationship to food? Yes. Will it completely fix it? No, there's more work to be done, but it will change the focus. But if you're always, imagine that always, it's always about how you look, how you look, how you look, you get it on a stage. 
It has nothing to do with how much you lifted, how strong you are. It doesn't even matter how big you measure with your biceps or whatever. It's how good you looked on stage. Yeah. That's what fucks with people. I can also make the argument coming from an athletic uh, sort of background that it would behoove an athlete to kind of go through uh, the discipline and dedication it takes to, to manage your macronutrients to figure out, you know, the best uh, formula for you specifically in your body uh, besides the, the performance aspect of it, just the, the knowledge of it to, to know, uh, you know, how your body reacts uh, and dive deep into nutrition. But, uh, again, like I think the the other is more common. Well, mm -hmm. I don't I don't necessarily think it's a, a a better or worse relationship. It's a different relationship. That's what it is. I mean, it, it could be just as detrimental to your health on both. I've sure. seen I've had uh, athletes that um, you know they they look you know aesthetically okay, but they eat like shit, and you cannot think that. That's not affecting their insides. And sometimes I think that can be, it's like the skinny fat person. I used to always tell my clients that were like really o overweight and, um, you know, they put on fat so easy. I used to tell them, hey, this is a blessing in disguise. Your body tells you when you're, you're not eating well mm. and it shows you. I've had many clients that have a lot of issues going on inside because they're skinny fat, because they don't put on a ton of extra weight. So you see that relationship very similar in your, you know, your athletic people like that are in sports like basketball baseball football they they're burning so many calories that they get away yeah. with i think there's just a lot more ignorance right and, yeah and it's I, a different relationship that's what i saw like i mean we're going to buffets we're going to like as many calories as i mean yes it is like what's going to do best for me performance wise on the field but then the association of uh consuming and buy like whatever it is like it doesn't matter the quality of it it was just a matter of like getting it in and you know performing and then that i was going to see what was going to happen well you guys have trained uh ex nfl and major league league baseball play i mean i have and a lot of them are in, in terrible shape because they were so used to always practicing always playing games that they never had to watch their diet and right. then now once the, that slows down oh yeah oh, they, these athletes are fucked yeah they're, they're the same behaviors they've had for 20 years of their life playing sports they no longer can have and they're completely lost so and that's a very bad relationship too with food it's so it's but it's different right the the bodybuilders uh, I would rank it. I, I mean, you can definitely rank it in terms of what's probably a worse place to be versus, you know, where it's easier. But you're right. I mean, when you're in season uh, versus off season for performance for athletes, that can definitely happen. It's worse. So, I, you know, if I were to rank these, I would say this. The worst is basing uh, your diet on how you look, which would be bodybuilders, models, that kind of stuff. The second one would be weight, how mm -hmm. much you weigh. So if you look at the sports where athletes – tend to have the biggest disparities between when they're competing and when they're not. Look at the sports that have a weight class. Boxers, wrestlers, Wrestling, yeah. MMA now, fighters. Those guys, now way I, different. I can make a case to challenge that, yeah. though. I can make a case to challenge that and say the opposite is true. Uh, because at least the bodybuilders, although they're driven by insecurities the way they look and they have a poor relationship because of those reasons, at least they've learned the tools on how to control their body weight up and down and what's a good amount of calories. They a good definitely are of, more informed. Right. They're, more, sure. they're way more informed. That's for sure. Because I've had professional athletes that looked amazing when they were professional athletes, but now that they're They 40, don't know how many calories. Yeah, they, have, they don't, they don't yeah. know what a fucking protein no is, a carb is. They, don't yeah. know what, they didn't know what anything was because they didn't have to worry about any of that. All they cared about was playing their sport. And so they're like teaching a child how to eat correctly. Yeah, so yeah. at least with a bodybuilder or, or let's say, let's say I get both of these X, right? X bodybuilder ex-pro athlete. They're both 45 years old. They both had bad relationships with food and now I have to work on them. It's just a different thing I'm working on. With the bodybuilder, I'm, they understand, when I tell them macros and all that, so that they, it computes very well with them, but then I have to get them to d detach from this insecure thing that they were driven by for so many years, where the athlete, you know, they may, they may not have some sort of an attachment to the way they look. They don't give a shit about that, but they're clueless on how to eat correctly. Oh, so, they have no idea yeah, on, yeah. on uh, ex-athletes have no idea on proper portions. Right. You know, I, I'll train like these ex-female athletes and they'll be like, hey, this is how I used to always eat, you know, when I, and I'm like, well, show me like, what is right. a typical meal? And I look, I'm like, that's a massive meal. You were eating that when you were training twice a day for and then the know, answer water is always more hit cardio to right. make up for it. Yeah, right. So I so. could so I could make the case that sure you know both of them it's they're they're different relationships. So I don't think that 
uh, one is worse than the other. I think uh, that they both uh, could. And they both could have okay relationships, too. I don't want to beat up on all athletes or beat up on all bodybuilders. Yeah, we're body speaking just somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but but if, you know, if we were, if I were to say that I had two people in the, you know, middle age that were ex-athlete and then was an ex-bodybuilder, both had poor relationships, I couldn't say, I, I wouldn't say that one is worse than the other. They're just different challenges as a coach it's that like I have to overcome. It's like the difference between hyper-focus and no focus. Yeah. You know, like too much focus yeah. and obsession. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a spectrum. Or, or none at all. Right. Um, no, that's a good point. And then the, the, what I what I said earlier about a little bit of a, what, what you, you might call a self-selection bias kind of plays a role. There's probably more, I, I mean, I, would, I, I could bet money that there's more body image insecurities going into Bodybuilding, sure. physique, bikini. Sure, that's mm-hmm. why a lot of people become, you know, bodybuilders. And yeah, less in terms of sports. Like less people are like, oh, I'm gonna go play basketball because I'm super insecure about being skinny or right, or, right. or fat or whatever. Next question is from Lewis Wooten, ninety two. How have you all dealt with being disciplined and going after and achieving personal fitness goals whilst maintaining a healthy social life and personal relationships? Uh, I think the Going after fitness goals can contribute positively to your social life and personal relationships so long as it's not a, an obsession or a an extreme fitness goal. Here's a thing that I think a lot of people um, need to realize. This took me a long time to realize. If you have super lofty, extreme goals, then that means you're going to have to apply a certain amount of singular, obsessive focus yeah. in which case it's probably going to take away People from will suffer around you yeah it's going to take away from certain things and that's okay so long as you don't live there for the rest of your life i think it's when you start to get problems where you're just singularly focused on one thing and everything falls apart and that's where you are forever then there's an issue but i mean you're, if you're starting a business if you want to get to a new pr if you want to compete in a high level competition are you going to be able to go out as much and hang out as much with your friends and that kind of stuff? Probably not. You know, it's going to take some 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 kind of obsession. There's- yeah, it's just the level of uh, what it means to you, you know? Like, what what are you trying to be the best of the best that's ever done it? You're going to have to sacrifice a lot. And that's, uh, you know, there's an extreme to that. And so the, the further you go on the extreme path is is where, like, most of your eggs are going to go. And that's that's, like at a certain point you just got to weigh that out like how much can i still balance like having friendships having all these people and like contributing towards them cuz really you know it's about being it's self pursuing something like i'm doing this all for myself but how much of it is just yourself or are you going to go ahead and uh you know be available to and make time for other people like that all that stuff is going to like feed into what you're going to experience it's an it's an interesting thought for me because I obviously went through this um, when I competed. It's by far the most uh, selfish thing that I've ever done in my entire life, uh, and and it it wasn't a singular selfish thing. It was you know over the course of three years, like three years of being dedicated to this crazy goal, right? Like I mean, it, to go from being way out of shape to all the way the professional level uh, competing on the stage is was a journey like that that that's not a, that's not going to be any, I, I went pretty fast too like that's a, that was a shortcut for most people so um, and in that time I remember uh, especially Katrina's family because her family uh, they they celebrate a lot and and the way they do that is food and drink and um, you know that was like a, a very regular thing that would happen and. I got a lot of grief and a lot of shit from her family and my friends, and I got teased. And um, you know, I didn't I didn't let it bother me because I was so focused on my goal, and I had I had an, uh, a vision, like I knew what I was doing, like I knew I had a plan on this wasn't going to be forever. Um, that I I set a serious goal for myself. I knew what comes with serious goals like that is sacrifice, and I was sacrificing some of these social events and things that we're going to do. Now, here's the thing that's interesting is while I was going through it, you know, I'm probably, I probably got uh, invited to less parties or things because people knew that I wasn't going to drink or eat like that. Um, I got teased and I got shit from her family uh, for doing all that. But when I followed through on everything and I, and I reached that 
crazy goal and then built something around it, um, I, I was revered in her family from it. And now everybody is, I mean, they talk about it, how proud they are of, of watching that and they can't believe it. And I remember when you started and used to say this and, oh, we used to get so annoyed that you'd bring your plastic Tupperware around and, and shit like that. And Especially because you did it the way you said you would. You, you got into it and left. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's, so, and that's what I think this person has to really mm -hmm. ask yourself when, you're, when you are uh, trying to go after achieving some, some personal fitness goals is wh why are you doing it um, and to what level and then- you know, and have a full plan. You know, my plan is I'm I'm gonna achieve this or of that. But then after I get to that goal, I'm gonna have more balance. And and that's exactly what I said I would do when I uh, when I got into it. It was funny because when we got into this podcast, I was in the middle of this already. And so you know, early I don't know first 500 episodes or so, um, you know, everybody thought I was the you know the the bodybuilder guy, and I knew all along that I wasn't that guy. It was, I had a serious goal at that time and, uh, how, how I do, uh, anything is how I do everything. If I put my mind to something and say, I'm going to accomplish this goal, I'm going to fucking do it. And, you know, and that means that I'm going to probably be talking about it all the time and focused on it all the time. And, you know, maybe rubbing some people the wrong way about it because they don't like it, or it may, it's a, a direct reflection for them and how they're not addressing their health and fitness goals. But I didn't give a shit about any of that stuff. It was, I'm, I'm going to hit this goal. And then when I do, I'll have more balance in my life. So um, I, I think there's there's ways uh, around it. And I, I still came to social events. I just carried my Tupperware and let people tease me and let people razz me about it and give me shit. Like, again, I was focused on a goal. Where, you're, where you don't want to be is the person that, that speaks out this goal or says you're going to do all this shit and you're wishy-washy and you're back and forth. Because at the end of the day, I think that's where you'll lose lose respect from your peers and, and, and others is when you mm -hmm. say you're going to do something and then you don't follow through. Either one, don't fucking talk about it, just do it. Or if you're going to talk about it and say you have these serious goals, then execute. And even the people that are teasing you while you're going through it or giving you a hard time, they'll, they'll, come around. they'll respect you. They'll respect you at the end of it. Yeah, I also think uh, people get into trouble with this when they don't realize the reason why they're so disciplined and focused. Is it because you're trying to fill an insecurity that can never be filled. You know, let's say, you know, using Adam's example, let's say he went into this because he was insecure about his body. Right. He'd still be doing it. Right. It would never end because that can never be cured by reaching new bodybuilding, you know, goals or whatever. That's such a good point. The goal was specifically to get a pro card, leverage that through social media business. It was actually one of the more important things that helped boost Mind Pump early on. It was the only social audience that we had. I had zero social media, anything. Justin had very little. Doug definitely had zero. Um, so it was a part of a plan. So that's where balance comes from. This is why it's okay to, this is why it doesn't counter. Think People think balance counters discipline. You know, which one do I do? No, it's not. If you have a goal and you're doing something and it's for a particular purpose, that's okay. But if yeah. but it depends on the purpose. Like if the purpose is to, like I need to be, you know, I'm super focused on becoming a millionaire. Well, why? Because then I can retire, make money, have balance. Okay. Is it, or no, because I, I need money because it makes me feel good. Well, you're going to be doing this forever. You're never going to find balance. You're going to be doing this forever. and It'll never be enough. That's where people come into the, the, the issues. I think with the, the obsession is when you find yourself obsessed and there is no end in sight. Um, but I mean, this is how you succeed. If you really want to mm -hmm. kick ass and and this is why you I stretch yourself. And this is the, I'll tell you this one right now. If you're listening and you don't have kids, that's the time. That's the best time. Not saying you can't do it when you have kids, but when you have children, you're uh, it's very difficult to find that kind of obsessive focus because you'll be taken away from the most important thing uh, that you've probably ever had in your entire life. So if you're in your 20s, 30s, yeah. you don't have kids. Being selfish is not going to benefit you if you have kids. Exactly. <laughs> I'll tell you that right That's now. when you'll kick yourself later yeah. on and be like, man, it's it was my idea. Well, you said it. You, I think you said it best, which uh, is what I was trying to allude to, which is you, you really have to question why whatever it is that you're doing and have a plan and have and, and understand the purpose behind all of it. Because you're right. If it's if it's rooted in insecurities, if I if it was because I was insecure about the way I looked and so that's what drove me to be so good at it, that'll never end. And you'll just find something else and you'll just and you'll be completely obsessed with it until you address the root cause. But there's nothing wrong with saying, Hey, you know what? 
I'd like to see what uh, I feel like when I get to this level of shape. I'd like to know how strong I'd be. I've never committed myself to a diet and a plan for six months, and I want to see how it would enhance my work life, my family life, my personal life, my overall health. And that's a, it's, it's an important goal for yourself. Like, fucking A, go get it. Go get it, and you're going to make some sacrifices. You're not going to be able to eat cake every fucking weekend with your friends. You won't be able to have drink drink on the weekdays. You probably won't be able to have Sunday fun day. But that's okay, though. The the experience – I mean, I, I look back at those three years, and, I mean, th that was one of the best experiences of, of my life, not just because it was amazing to get in that great a shape, but, I mean – as long as I've been doing this for and, and all the books I've read and all the certifications and experience and knowledge I have, it still taught me a ton about myself and it, it made me that much better of a coach. So the value that it added uh, for my life was incredible. So, uh, I mean, if you, if you go into it with that attitude that w what you're doing, the reason why you're making the, the sacrifice on the social side, um, I, I think it'd be very beneficial. Totally. Now, we did mention in this episode uh, the ab training guide. You can find that at mindpumpfree.com. Now, on that site, you can also find other guides. We have guides on getting you to squat more weight, burn body fat effectively, and other performance and aesthetic goals. Again, that's mindpumpfree.com. By the way, you can also find the three of us on Instagram, we each have individual Instagram pages with their own uh, information, a lot of it about our own personal lives. So you can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sound. You can find Adam at Mind Pump Adam.